Welcome. How are you guys doing? Good. See, we have some guests, some our EA pals and, and otherwise. Glad to see you guys. Um, so um, we're going to have a special guest speaker today. He's from Bethesda. Bethesda has a couple different studios, but he's in um, Maryland. And so uh, this is Joel Burgess. Now, I've known Joel for 10 years, I guess. Oh, that, yeah. 10 years. I had Joel in a, a game engine class. He was a digital media student at UCF before or five even existed. And uh, I had him in a class there. And uh, he was one of the best students in that class, for sure, which is uh, which, which makes sense, right? <laughs> um, and then uh, he actually went to Terminal Reality as his first game studio, worked on Anne Flux and Blood Raid 2, and then he found his way to Bethesda, working on Elder Scrolls, and then Fallout 3, and then uh, Skyrim. And so he's currently a senior designer there, and he's definitely had his fair share of levels that he has pumped out, and his fair share of level designers that he has led. So he's had a great career up till now, so we are fortunate to hear from him. He's going to give you a talk that is uh, uh, the next evolution of a talk that he started giving at GDC on level design to a whole big group of, of people, of other level designers in the industry. So um, it's going to be a, a nice talk. I've seen the slides already. He's extremely well prepared, which is great. I love it when folks um, work hard to give you guys good quality talks. So I'm very excited about this. So please give a hand to Joel Burgess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me, guys. Uh, like Ron said, I was here about 10 years ago, so I look like a, about a decade older. Michelle looks about two decades older, and I think Ron's gotten younger. So <laughs> this is a talk that I gave originally two GDCs ago, um, but I did want to mix it up for you guys here and give you sort of a fire remix of the talk. Um, just as a caveat, you know, apologies in advance for myself, this talk by its structure is kind of meandering. And then I added a bunch of stuff to it to update it sort of a post-Skyrim world for you guys. So I apologize if I kind of stutter or get lost. I'm, I'm going to try to work through it and get some time in the Q&A at the end if possible. So at GDC 2010, uh, that was the first year that I was part of a group called Level Design in a Day. And we give a pre-conference tutorial session. We give a bunch of talks. And uh, afterwards, one of the attendees came up to me and asked me like this really simple question about how you go about making levels for world games. And it should be easy for me because, as Ron mentioned, the vast preponderance of my experience through Oblivion, Fallout 3, and now Skyrim has been making open world games. But I really floundered with this and I gave him kind of a junk answer. And that bothered me when I got home. And so I knew that if we we're going to be invited back for GDC in 2011, that this is what I was going to try and talk about. And so I thought about why this question stymied me. And it really got into it being such a broad question. Because when you talk about level design, it seems like a simple enough concept at the root. But even at the first junction of what you might be talking about, whether it's single or multiplayer, things get more complicated. The conversation changes because there's an entirely different set of parameters of what makes a good multi or good single player uh, level. Then you add all these additional variables that might be things to do with your game, your genre, or the platform that you're going to be on. And then you end up in different whole genres that are based on different tenets of level design. And a level designer working on an RPG might be speaking a different language than somebody working on a single player FPS or multiplayer FPS or a horror game. And so in order to tackle the question, I felt like I needed to look inside myself, think about why I made games and why I was attracted to making the kinds of games I make. And it got into what exactly do we mean when we talk about open world games? See, the thing is, when people talk about open world games, their minds tend to go to a couple of different archetypes. You know, we sort of have the open sandbox world over on the Bethesda side of things, and there's a little more mission-based structure, um, like a Grand Theft Auto. And ever since GTA 3 came out, there have been a lot of games which we think of as open games, sort of children of GTA 3. But if you go further back, you don't just have to rely on recent memory. There are older games which, when you think about it, also obey some of the tenets of what we think of as open games. MMOs, it's basically a staple. You expect an open world from an MMO, and it's not strictly a Western thing either. Plenty of games from Europe and Asia have been open world for many, many years. And then you get into games which aren't open world, but we still think of in sort of the same breath when we talk about open world games. That is, nobody's going to talk about Deus Ex and claim this an open world game. It doesn't have a streaming massive world. It has mission structures, clear objectives. Yet it still somehow fits our thinking when we talk about open world games. And it's because players have this freedom to move through paths. It's just the same thing as Sims. It's a very open, systemic sort of game, same as Spore. And what I realized is that the emphasis, the common undercurrent, is that a lot of these games really emphasize player agency. 
And agency is sort of the vogue word right now to talk about player choice. The players having freedom to impact the world. And again, since GTA 3, we've seen an explosion of interest in these genres. You know, once upon a time, Oblivion uh, era, we had our own little sandbox. Nobody else was really making games like Bethesda, but every year we get a little less special, right? We have to really think about what we're doing to compete with other people making open world games because we're fascinated. Gamers want to play open games. And for me at least, because it became such a personal question, I had to think about why I liked open world games or why I liked games to begin with. And I have this distinct memory. And I couldn't tell you whether it was an Atari or an arcade cabinet or just a computer somebody had hooked up. But I remember the first time I saw somebody manipulate some sort of input device and affect a change on screen one to one. Well, I could call an actor, but I don't know what it was. It was probably some you know, ASCII game on Apple II. But it turned what I'd been looking at in the short span of my life so far from this passive entertainment in front of a screen to something that I could be a part of. And that drove me for years and years before I really knew about games, before I really knew about games as a career. It utterly fascinated me at a base level, and that's why I do what I do. And I also think it gets into why open games are important. A lot of people are going to say things about our potential as an art form, our potential as a medium, is greater than that of film or, or of uh, writing even, because of interactivity. Now, I don't know that our potential is necessarily greater than any other medium, but I know that interactivity is the thing that we have, right? That's the thing that makes us special. And there are a lot of areas where we lag behind, say, storytelling from film, but our max potential there is just as good as theirs. They will never reach our potential for interactivity because it will always be an afterthought, where it's an integral part of what we do. And I think open games are important because open games place the emphasis on this. We look at interactivity, we look at player choice, and we build our decisions based on that first. And that's kind of the underlying structure of this talk. So, let's get into detail. One of the things that I've always felt sort of special about being a designer, a level designer in particular, is that you have this sense of shared authorship with the experience of the player. That is, we build these experiences, and the level designer in particular is with the, you know, the, the level designer is almost on the couch next to you playing the game and giving you the next great thing that you're going to see, you're going to do, creating the potential for that. It's a partnership, really. But the player is an unpredictable character in our lives, right? I mean, with certain exceptions, for the most part, we're putting a product in a box and putting it, you know, uploading it to Steam or sending it to real st retail stores, but we're not actually there with them. We're authoring something together, but we don't get to be a part of the experience when it happens at runtime. So who is this guy, right? Who's the player? Well, one thing you should know about the player, particularly in open world games, is that there's somebody who's trained to defy you. If you've ever played a game, where you went through a door and the door drops behind you and you can never open it again, and you find out at the water cooler maybe a week later that you just missed out on like the Omega Weapon Class 5. <laughs> this is you, right? One of the things about level design is we talk a lot about giving players direction and cues. Always remember that there's this guy who's a lot of players who is going to look for those cues and do the other thing every time. And also remember that the player is always smarter than you. You're not there to put up an invisible wall just before they jump over it. You're not there to fix a loophole in your scripting just before they exploit it. And you're not there to rewrite the dialogue to prevent the NPC from sounding schizophrenic because they chose two different branches that didn't work well and weren't conditioned out from each other. It doesn't matter how many little walls you build around your garden, the player's going to find a way over. Also remember this person's not a jerk. A lot of designers, especially once you get into trenches, will uh, we'll talk about jackass bugs, right? We're like, why did this thing happen? Players being a jackass, right? <laughs> Maybe there's some valid point cases, edge cases for this, but for the most part, you'll find your life a lot easier if you accept what the player's gonna do, you accept these things about the player, and you know that you're, they're going to do them, and you do your best as a designer to support those, right? And that tends to be less emphasis on focused author edge cases and more of an approach of how you approach things at the base level of thinking openly and about providing the capacity for your content, whatever it may be, to support multiple paths of interaction. It gets into what I kind of think is this unspoken contract between the player and the designer. 
And the first tenet is that you have to remember the player is in control. This may seem obvious. But we have this sort of God complex as designers to think of ourselves as controlling, right? We're authoring the content, we're putting it in front of the player. But in reality, the player is really the one driving the experience. I mean, we're not there. We've already accepted that they break our rules when we're not looking. If you've ever played uh, Jason Moore's Sleep is Death, I, I hear a few muffled uh, chuckles of recognition, but for the most of you, you may not have heard of this game. It's an indie game that came out uh, about two years ago. So I'll explain it briefly. This is a two-player turn-based game. This interface is the author interface, and then there's the player interface. And the player interface is pretty much just this part of the screen here. And it's turn-based, so basically, the player is presented with a scene. And the player can move their little avatar anywhere in the scene, and they can interact. So they basically just have a voice box. You can see the player here is using the voice box to ask if they're a tiny dog or a horse, or a tiny horse or a dog. And then they have an action key, which is basically the same exact thing, but with the different graphics, so that the storyteller knows they're trying to do a verb, as opposed to express you know, some dialogue. Then the turn switches over to the author. Now this is the author's interface. Now what happens is that the author goes through and they can assemble their little sort of uh, environmental uh, set pieces, their objects for the world, different audio cues, animations, scene changes, dialogue bubbles, all of this, and they have about two minutes max to do it. And that's how the game oscillates. You have a time limit as a player to act, and then you have a time limit as the author to react, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. What's really interesting about Sleep is Death, and why I recommend anybody who wants to be a designer, particularly narrative games, play it, is how hard it is to be the author. And you'll see a lot of people who play Sleep is Death craft these stories. They have these meticulous environments that they build out, these planned interactions, these great social statements they want to make. And then like somebody will spend 20 turns trying to fiddle with a tree in the first scene that was like a background element. It's similar to the dynamic for anybody who's played Dungeons and Dragons or other pen and paper RPGs, where you'll have the dungeon master who has that sort of god complex, and I made the story and I control it, and then the players like subvert that right away and they want to spend all their time trying to sleep with the wench in the bar, right? <laughs> the players are actually the ones driving the experience. And the more you try and tightly all the things, the harder your life as a creator is going to be. Because a player will always go the other direction if he found you. Now that's frustrated by our need to stay backstage. And I talked earlier about tandem authorship and the fact that we have this special relationship, this companionship with the player. But that's not what we want the player to feel, right? We want the player to feel like they are the agent in this world. They are part of these events. They're, they're moving the story forward. The world is happening around them, without them, in reaction to them. They don't want to feel your hand on their shoulder every time. And there are certainly a lot of little things that we can do as designers that put the presence of our control on the player, whether it's highly scripted solutions to uh, sequences in a room or cutscenes or anything like this. Anything that reminds the player of our presence generally is a bad thing. And then we also get into the need to fulfill expectations. Now, expectations are a really important part of games because expectations really are about rules. And games, depending on how fundamental you want to get with the conversation, are about rule sets and players acting within rule sets. In video games, those tend to be constraints of the simulation and you know, the programming that we put in. They can also be rule systems like if you're playing a game of Go, Go exists because of the rules. Say, for instance, when you play Mario, you learn that if you jump into the bottom of a yellow box, something comes out the top. It might be a coin, it might be a mushroom, it might just be a, a sound effect, but there's an action-reaction here that you learn is consistent, and that's a foundation of trust. There's a reason why you don't have a scene in the beginning of your game in your tutorial where the player is able to kick down a metal door and then have 50 metal doors that have the same texture later in the game, which are totally static and non-interactive. It's a violation of trust. And the more that you can find these ways to reinforce player action, reaction, and trust, the stronger that relationship is going to be, the stronger that contract between you and the player. Now, you can play around with expectations. The Mimic is a classic example of this, sort of brought back recently by Torchlight 2, Diablo, of the treasure chest that turns into a monster. And this is a great, fun way to play with expectation, but you have to be careful with it. Right? If you overdo these things, you're going to violate that trust. And players will not know what to expect. And finally, the most important point for me, and a lot of conversations I have, 
He said, the player's story is always more important than the story you were trying to tell. It's this thing that some designers struggle with. You may have spent a lot of time crafting character motivations, pacing, set, it doesn't matter. If the story that the player wants to tell in Skyrim is that they were able to run a horse up a vertical cliff and find a back way in to kill Aldo in one shot, bravo, Shakespeare. That's your story, right? <laughs> That's what matters most, because they got to author it. They felt like they authored it. Now, there's absolutely a case for players playing through your story and getting all the beats that you wanted, and maybe that's a better experience for that player, but that is the sum total of that person's reality, where the player who exploited the game and found all these glitches, their sum total of their experience in their reality is the story that they told. They don't necessarily go and yardstick their experience against somebody else's. What they experience is all they experience, and it's absolutely more important. And so if you have a story that's fragile, that breaks down when players start to disobey, you have to rethink it, right? And there's one of two things you can do. You can start building walls around the garden and making it harder for players to break your story, or you can try and find ways to make your story work for more players and more circumstances. There are a lot of things that we can do then to get into how we build worlds and how we build experiences to create this sort of framework, this scaffolding upon which players can tell their own stories without us getting in the way too much. It gets into a sort of mentality of setting things up for fun and setting aside maybe some of our ambitions in favor of creating capacity for players to live out their own stories and see their own ambitions brought to light. There's an anecdote that I've told before about imagining you're an artist and you've been contacted by some local exhibit to put together a room and they're doing an exhibit on the Phoenix. And you have your choice of tools. On the one hand, you have a box of oil paints. Right? And they say, you can do a floor mural. Sit down on the, on the floor and paint this beautiful oil image of a phoenix rising from the ashes, however you want. And you can paint that thing, it will be beautiful, right? The other option is a box of dominoes. You can use the dominoes instead of the oils. And you can set up this phoenix emerging from the ashes, a sort of a kinetic sculpture, put it up on the floor, set it up, and that's your piece. Now on exhibit night, People can come in and they can look and they can see the phoenix and they observe it and it's beautiful and maybe they appreciate your brush strokes or maybe they just think the colors are pretty and then move on. Or you set up with the dominoes. And the first group comes in and they see these dominoes standing up. They don't really make sense of the image. And somebody leans down and tips over the first one or they bump it on accident even. And they fall. And you don't know exactly how they're going to fall. If you've ever done domino sculptures, sometimes they don't go right. Sometimes they break and they go down in different components or the order breaks down. But the experience of that group versus the dozens of other groups that saw the oil painting was different. Because even though you spent hours meticulously sketching the lines and setting up the dominoes and figuring out how you wanted to work, they're going to do it in an instant, and they're going to feel like, I did that. That's my thing. I was a part of it. And it might only work for the first group, right? Maybe you have to come in. It takes 50 minutes to reset. But you've given those people a participatory experience. And that's what games can do. Right? There's a lot of great oil paintings in film and literature and games, but there's not enough domino paintings. Right? There's not enough interactive art for people, and that's why there's so much interest in us right now. So in that mindset of trying to set things up so the players are drawn through things in the most favorable way, we'll talk about some environmental techniques that we can use to give cues, which are hopefully subtle enough that players don't feel heavily pushed by the designer. Distant landmarks are a classic, almost to the point of cliche to bring up Cinderella's castle. Now, when John Hench and the, the, uh, the old men of Disney put together the parks, there was no blueprint, right? These guys did it first. They did it before games. They did it before anybody had done themed spaces. Their work has influenced malls, theaters, video games, film, everything. Now, since we're in Orlando, this is an easy example, right? You've all been here, right? If you haven't been, you should. Get down to the parks. The experience of arriving at Cinderella's Castle starts from the minute you get off the monorail or the ferry. And you can see the spires in the distance. And it's definitely the most interesting thing around. You've passed the resorts, you've passed the monorail, you see the ticketing booths, that's just a functional space. Those spires stick up above the whole park. And you approach and you get your tickets and you go through the archways. There are these tunnels at the front of the park and they have movie posters for all the rides. It's all very carefully thought out. You enter that first area and you go down Main Street. 
And so this picture is actually not so much about the castle, but it's about Main Street. Because as you pass all these buildings, there are no rides here. There's nothing really exciting here. There's shops, first aid, place you pick up your pictures. There's some food. It's nothing that anybody does when they first get in the park and their kids are tugging them by the arm. They all want to go see that thing, right? They want to get to that. And what they designed here, around the Walt Disney statue that you can kind of make out here, there's a huge, huge circular space which is open. And they, these guys, to show how much they influenced the game, said they called that the hub. And the hub was this meeting space where the families were meant to kind of get to the castle, which, by the way, is not that interesting. It's like just a restaurant and a hallway, and that's it, right? You get to the castle, and you've seen these things just kind of bookmarked, like, oh, there's the gift shop, and there's the photo. I'll get that on the way out. And then all of a sudden, you're, you've achieved your goal, but there's nothing else around. But now, if we were to say to show a second shot, you would realize that there's Futureland, and there's Tomorrow, or Tomorrowland is Futureland. There's all the little mini parks within the park that you see, and they each have their own Cinderella castle that sits off and pulls you through. And what's brilliant about this is they did crowd management in how they navigate or how they built the space, because there's a path left through the castle and to the right that each go different ways, and none of the landmarks in the other worlds are designed to overpower each other. They're all meant to be sort of similarly appealing. People get there, they plan their days, and they split up, and they go different ways, and the park doesn't get congested. You'll see this problem in like Islands, for example. Islands is a fantastic park that takes a lot of cues here. But one thing that Islands didn't do great is that they do the grown-up and they do the kitty with the Seuss and the Hulk, and everybody goes to the Hulk first. So early day of the park, the, like the Marvel area is super congested, and then this, actually it's probably not true now with Potter, but the point is that these guys distributed people really well through inherent uh, flow and space. It's something we can copy too. We do this a bit in Skyrim. We do it all over the place in Skyrim, actually, but when you first uh, hit Riverwood, which is our best guess of where people go first because the story takes you there and the environment flows that way, when you leave Riverwood, we want to show you Dragon's Reach, which is the castle at the top of White Run, which is where the player is meant to go next for the story to advance. And so we actually have a path where we use a lot of these cliff rocks to channel the player out and create uh, straight sight lines out to this big POI that we have in the center of the tundra. And then when you get there, we open things up quite a lot. And at this point, we know that most players go off and do things other than the main quest. That's fine. So that's when near nearby landmarks are just as important. And this shot from Fallout 3, we're in the Northwest Wasteland. And the Northwest Wasteland is characterized by being more rocky and more sparse than other parts of the wasteland. But we're periodically to use, use these big satellite towers. And those satellite towers are usually the tallest thing, these in the elevated highways. And we plan that players are going to be drawn by these things. But again, we place other things nearby. So those are both places. That's a dungeon there, that industrial building. I think there's a radio signal at that water tower, which is one of the pieces of content we were really proud of and want people to find. And so we put those around these distant landmarks so that when you get close, you have these nearby landmarks that pop up in front of you. It's something we'll talk about elsewhere today as well. Same goes for White Run. When you first get out to White Run, we have a giant fighting some uh, of the Companions Guild, and that starts off a quest line if you go there. We have distant ruins that show up all through the world on the tops of mountain ridges. There's, of course, the carriage and the caravan merchants there, so if you go towards White Run, you might hit the carriage and you decide to go to Windhelm or something instead. And then we have the farms and all these other things. And it's all designed to present you with sort of a paced meter of distant landmark, nearby landmark, distant landmark, nearby landmark. And that feeds back into the goal structures we'll talk about later. Um, I'm actually going to skip this video just for time. Um, point Lookout was a DLC for Fallout 3 I worked on. The main point here is that with Point Lookout, we broke one of our own rules and we took control from the player on the camera. Let's see. And so when you first go to Point Lookout, it's a different landmass. It's like a swamp setting, so it's very different from the, uh, the dry wasteland of the main world of Fallout 3. There we go. And so what we do is on this boat ride, which is about 30 seconds long, we show you a number of different things. So at the very end of the shot, we show you a lighthouse. Lighthouses are great because they're animated. They prevent, uh, present motion in the environment. They're big. And they're sort of inherently interesting to people. There's a lot of photographs of lighthouses on Flickr. We also show you this mansion with smoke. Again, introducing uh, motion in the environment. It's a smaller POI. This is our next story beat. We want people to go there. This, by the way, is directly in the way of the lighthouse if you happen to go there by land. 
We also show you a Ferris wheel, which is actually a very close landmark, it's something you would have never seen in the main game of Fallout 3. So we present players with that right away. And also in that video, we show one of the new creature types of the game, shambling off into the distance, hopefully picking up the silhouette against the uh, horizon, so the players will see that there's something new, and it's going to be something they might not see for a little while. Oops. So I mentioned motion environment. That's a really powerful thing. It's something we've tried to get better at, at Bethesda over the years because when you look at Oblivion, we're too often guilty of being a screenshot to put the controller down. So we really try and use motion and think about it. One of the things where motion gets uh, handy is with moving water. Moving water does a great job of leading people places. And it's one reason why whenever we have streams like this in our worlds, we tend to look at where they terminate and try and put something interesting there. It's not uncommon to follow a stream in Skyrim and end up in a Spriggan's lair or something like that. It ties into the use of prior knowledge. People come to your games with all kinds of baggage that comes from being a human. You can use that. Any rogues, they go somewhere. Nine times out of ten, if you follow a rogue to go, play, go a place, and if players are lost and they see a rogue, they'll hop on it and they can have trust that it's going to take them someplace interesting. Same goes for bridges. Architecturally interesting all the time. People love bridges. Signposts, an obvious one. Distant smoke, flowing water, we've talked about. Another good thing is lit windows and fires to show people signs of life to go towards things. And of course, the tracks of vehicles and creatures, other actors in your environment that they can follow. Another really powerful thing is sound, right? Don't forget about audio because it matters a bunch. One of the best uses of audio in Fallout 3, which we didn't actually mean to do, was a happy accident was the fact that when players are wandering through the wasteland, we stream in an area, what we call the 5x5. Five five. It's five cells square that the player's at the center of at all times. So we'd stream in edges of the 5x5. Five five. We'll stream in, say, a raider encampment, but we also will stream in random actors, because our random actors run their AI in low process all the time. So caravans always have a position. It's just updated infrequently. So you get to the edge of 5x5, five five and you load in a raider camp. And there's a caravan that's pathing through the area too, and they get loaded up into high, uh, into high memory. And a fight breaks out. Now that's not necessarily desirable for us because you know this thing's happening off screen, except Fallout, because it had grenades and bullets and guns, you had these sort of systemically muffled, distant explosions and gunfire. And what we found is that every time, players would stop what they were doing, turn towards the source of sound, and go check it out. Luckily for us, when they got there, it tended to be interesting because there were corpses or the fight was still going on or whatever the case may be. Of course, it usually happened at a POI that was authored, like that Raider camp. And so it was this great way that people were being led to content that we had never designed that just became part of the game. We liked it so much, we thought about it more with Skyrim. Now, things like anvils and crafting stations, traditionally, like in Oblivion, are something that we use as like a town device. We use them to draw you into town. We want towns to have their own function. We wouldn't do this sort of thing. But we ended up using anvils and guys using pickaxes and stuff into like, bandit dungeons all the time. Because you would move into a big open space like this. This is actually the inside of a dungeon. This isn't the world. And you'd hear the distant tink, tink, tink of a guy banging on an anvil. And you know, bad guy's that way. And you start looking that direction. Thanks to all the Reddit readers. <laughs> so what are we doing here, right? We got off the track. What we're trying to do is create goals. We want to create a specific motivation within people when they play our games. The emotion on Liz Lemon's face in this shot is what we're going for. <laughs> This is what marketers spend billions of dollars every minute of every day trying to get out of you, right? You've got competition for this emotional response because they want you to want things. Now, it's not enough to say that you should do something. You want people to have the motivation of themselves, right? You want to pull an inception on them. You want them to want to do it and not realize that they've been influenced by you. That's actually what we're doing here. We're trying to set people up to do what we know is going to be most interesting because they trust us, but we don't want them to ever know we were there. We want them to feel independent motivation. That's what we're trying to do. So we should then talk a little about what goals are and how player motivation works. One thing that we can do is aim for the player always to have a goal. We also need to know what types of goals our game permits. 
what types of structures work in our game. You know, players might want to score points, and that might seem like the short-term thing that people most want to do. But you see a lot of non-RPG games adding long-term RPG uh, investments. And that's because players might not care necessarily about getting the most points in the game they're playing now, but they want to get the passive bonus from having played that game that feeds into their RPG arc for their characters further on the road. Now, in Skyrim, we do an okay job of this. Possibly the point of overwhelming people with goals sometimes. But these are just explicit goals. This is just one type of goal that we gave it into. Now, it is true that we always try and let people have a goal in our games in terms of using the quest system. In Fallout 3, when you start the game, find dad is your quest objective that just sits there in your pit board for hours, right? You've got this goal, this sort of long-term goal, works just like the landmarks, by the way, and then you pick up these short-term goals along the way that you can sort of pick off. There are also player-determined goals. Now, if you play Crackdown, I don't think there's an explicit goal in the game narrative to get the agility orbs. But they're there, and they're pretty, and they're hard to get, and you want to get them. And a lot of players who enjoy Crackdown didn't really advance the story or unlock all the islands, but they got all 50 orbs in the one city landmass, because it's fun to scale up the buildings and jump around and get all that stuff. Now, a designer absolutely created the scaffolding for that goal, but they never told you go do it, right? The player chose to do that goal. And the game is designed to be ambivalent about whether or not you went and got them. You could get them or not get them. It suits the designers just fine. The player chose to do it, and that's fine too. They created support for that by putting in the environment and helping you boost your stats. Now, there are also emergent goals. And emergence is uh, sort of an overused word. So what I mean by it here is that goals that come up out of the world's simulation of putting things in front of you. The, best example I can think of is Minecraft. So Minecraft, you might have a simple goal, which is to build that castle you saw on YouTube, or to go explore that distant island, or to build a roller coaster. Now say that you want to uh, build that roller coaster. Well, if you've played Minecraft, you need a bunch of iron to do that, which means you need to start digging. If you want to start digging, you should probably have a good little house to hide in at night, and a good mining operation. And then you build a little staircases down there, and you've realized that you've kind of found all the iron you can find there, but there's like a good deposit of it on the island across the way, so you have to build a boat, figure out how to build a boat, go to Wikipedia, build a boat, go across the way, feed the skeletons, build another house over there, because you kind of got a good operation going there, figure that mine out, move the stuff over the other way, start building the first track, and it's been a week, right? It's been a week, and you forgot what you were doing in the first place, because you have all these little emerging goals that are purely uh, resultant of the system that just puts these things in front of you by being what Minecraft is. And those are sort of the ultimate player-determined goals, because sort of having built the world to be systemic in this way, not should have put those in like the agility orbs. You put them in. You really motivate yourself to do them because he's just created this world that interacts with itself in an interesting way. Similar but different, goals of opportunity. This is really just a type of goal that falls sort of in the second category of player determined, at least with the example I'll give you. If you played World of Warcraft, at some point you probably had a character that was a miner. Now, mining characters in World of Warcraft go around the world, and occasionally there are these randomly generated nodes where you can get minerals. And so, say you're going along the road, and you see one of these things pop up in your mini-map, and you look over there, and you see that there's some iron, but there's a camp of mobs maybe 10 feet away from it. And you make a decision. I can just ride on by. Maybe iron's not that good for me, or those mobs are way too tough for me, I got somewhere to be. I can hop off there, and maybe those mobs are a little tough for me, but I've got the resources to pull them and take them out one by one and sort of have this huge battle for just this one little resource thing. You could call in higher level friends or friends in the area, ask for help getting it. You could wait for somebody else to try and pull the mobs and then ninja steal it from them. <laughs> well, you just right on by. But it's this little snap choice that players make in the environment, right? There are all these little parameters that they get to weigh and decide if they want to seize that goal of opportunity. And those are interesting decisions for the Sid Meier fans in the audience, right? Creating the capacity for those decisions to happen when and wherever is only a good thing, I think. And sort of as a footnote, there are out of game goals that we have. People have lots of opinions about achievements. I won't get into those. But they're there. And they're part of game culture, they're part of I mean they're part of CERT. You have to put them in, right? So you can use them. Now, Bethesda, we don't tend to use them in this way. We tend to just 
you finish a quest line and you get an achievement. But other games have done interesting things with achievements. You can, for instance, uh, show players how to do things that the game permits, which are interesting, but maybe not part of the narrative, right? So say you realize that if you combine you know, explosive and acid damage, you can do some crazy effect to kill a monster in Borderlands. It might not make sense. Borderlands is a terrible example because those guys could contrive of a goal for that off the cuff, I'm sure. But it might not be easy for you to contrive of an in-game way to show the player this fun thing you can do. Achievements are a great way to show the player this weird, contrived, fun thing you can do. You can also do fun and weird narrative things with it. For instance, I think uh, 50 Cent Blood in the Sand, I'm pretty sure, has one of the coolest achievements. If you play the game on easy and you die, you get an achievement for being a sucker. Right? It's just a zero point achievement for, for sucking. It's awesome. And you cannot delete an achievement off your account, by the way. It's a genius. So it's just one of those things. It's part, as a developer, it's part of the culture, it's part of the life. Maybe you can find cool things to do with it. It's just another facet of player goals. So, like we talked about with the sort of the micro goal, the, the opportunity goal, there are different components that players would uh, weigh. Now, of course, risk-reward is well-trod territory. We always talk about risk-reward. Players will weigh that. And there are many different ways that the player can judge that uh, for themselves. There's also the motion, a notion of commitment. Now, I'll make an assertion here, which I have no like data to back up, but I suppose it's likely that people tend to choose goals which they feel fit the time commitment they have available. So say that you're, you're married, You've got kids and a house and a mortgage, and you know your husband is out, and you've got 30 minutes that you can play the game. You're going to choose a 30-minute goal, one that you perceive to be 30 minutes. The weekend comes, everybody's busy doing things. You got the house to yourself for the whole afternoon. Maybe this is a day that you find that, right? And you choose what feels like a multi-hour commitment. That's just a supposition that I'll make, but it's an argument for having goals at scale to different levels again, for people to be able to pick things off and do them quickly and pick things off that they'll do long term. MMOs are built on this in a big way, where MMOs more and more try and give you micro achievements that you'll accomplish, whether it's leveling up a trade skill, leveling up your main character, or whatever the case may be. But you're not going to go on a raid in 20 minutes. There's also the notion of inherent interest. Different people like different things. You're going to make goals, and you're going to write stories that people just don't care about. And that's fine, right? There should be other things that those people can be interested in if they're the sort of person that's interested in your game in the first place. So it's, again, being aware of what types of goals your game affords. They're then trying to satisfy those kinds of goals as frequently as possible and present them for people to uh, pick up of their own accord. Some of this makes it sound like we're powerless, right? Players have their own motivations, their own things that they want to do. We can't really exert any direct control to you know, exercise our own authorship. But that's not the case, right? It just comes down to trying to provide interesting goals for the widest range of player interests possible. Now, this might sound like a point about mass appeal, and trying to make a game that everybody in the grandma is going to like. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. It's about knowing your game, knowing what kinds of goals fit into your game. Now, in Fallout, we have all these different archetypes, right? We try and support players who want to use speech, who want to be nonviolent, who want to be on chems all the time or use a certain weapon archetype. So for us, when we make a Fallout game, our work's cut out for us. There are a lot of player interests that we officially support. Your game might have two or three, right? Your game might just have two. But the point is to be cognizant of it. You know, a good game that does player choice really well but feels way more linear than Skyrim or the recent Walking Deads from Telltale Games. Those games are fantastic at storytelling. And you might think that a guy like me, saying some of the things I've said, thinks that game is sort of trite and old-fashioned because it's telling a linear story. But it's not. Those guys have done an amazing job of creating a branching narrative where every path combination is really good, and they cut off huge swaths of content late in the later episodes based on the choices you make early. They had the work cut out for them to create an a experience has the illusion of being a well-structured linear narrative when it's really this amazing branching narrative that they've done. But they were hyper aware of the types of players that play their game, the types of decisions they may make, and then trying to provide difficult decisions that tax them on their choices throughout the experience. I really should put an animated GIF of American flag. I would have finished this. <laughs> 
So we've learned a little bit, I hope, right? We've at least acknowledged some of the things that surround us when we're trying to give player motivation in an open game. But we want to design now that into the experience and not just the spaces. And this gets into one of the things that we do a lot at Bethesda, which I call deliberate distraction. Now, deliberate distraction is a notion of giving players micro goals in front of them in spite of large goals that they might have. Now, in any RPG, in most games really, it's not uncommon to have a point A to point B thing. The player picks up some story nuggets, gives them the objective, go to point B, you're gonna traverse some space there. But if you think of this as a graph of entertainment level over time, and we assume that point A is really interesting and you've done a great job, and point B is really exciting and you're motivated to get there and you've done a great job there too, there's still sort of an inherent drop in that transportation. If you're not doing anything over the time of point A to point B, this is something that you have to deal with, right? This is one reason why a lot of games like Bethesda games get criticized as being walking simulators and getting dull because you move between maybe these points that you care about and there's nothing going on, right? There are a lot of people who play open world games who you know, voice a preference for a linear game that just cuts out all the go-between. So this is something that we try and combat. <coughs> so using deliberate distraction, what we'll do, this is actually a very real step of the design process of Bethesda, is when we're working on a game, we take the map, and we place all the sort of point A to point Bs, all the little fetchy bits, requests. This is where you're gonna be, and then you have to change location and go to this part of the world and this part of the world. Of course, for us, our world density is a big part of how we design things, so it's just a fact of life. You can't always contrive of an instant way to get from point A to point B. So we draw these lines. We have this sort of crisscrossy map. And what we do then, is we spread our POIs, or points of interest, around those lines. That actually influences how we choose to place our non-quest locations. Again, this is something some designers will be uncomfortable with, because the goal here is that players may choose to go check out X and Y, they skip Z, and that's fine. And you might feel like, oh, you know what, the, my story pacing was really good, and, and point A to point B just flow into each other, and having X and Y get in the way just disrupts my narrative pacing. That the player's story matters more than your story. If your story hit home with them and it, it just fired on all cylinders and checked all the boxes, you know they probably will be aligned from A to B and be totally engaged in thinking about your story on the right. But some people won't be. And for those people, they'll see X off on the left and they'll be interested and they'll veer off and go check that out. They'll see Y go in that way. And you know what? Hopefully X and Y were entertaining and they had a good time there. And it got them to B. Or that person may have been in a huge role on the way in between. So now, our entertainment over time graph, hopefully it looks something more like this. Again, we're assuming that X and Y are interesting. They might suck, but hopefully they're good. You know, maybe not even as good as A and B are, but there's still things a player got to do. And it's not even the fact that you hit like these high points, but that you got this pacing arc. Freytag's pyramid is a common thing that gets talked about in creative writing, in uh, game design, where you want people to have a sense of climax and resolution. That's what's happening here. This is just gray tags pyramid at a better frequency. That's what we're trying to go for with deliberate distraction. But it comes from fundamentally being okay with players being distracted. If you're okay and you just embrace it and you let go of the notion that you're gonna be controlling the player by the eyeballs constantly, you can get to this. Another frequent frustration for people trying to work into the world of games is dealing with empty area. Again, we build space. We care about the spaces being believable. One of the things that we really try and strive for at Bethesda is the notion that if you can see it, you can go there. With few exceptions, like the edges of the world, we try and make that true. We try and deliver on that promise. Again, building that trust. That's just a rule of our game. But some people, some artists in particular, will feel like, well, that's just for looks, right? If you want to create a dramatic vista, and you have this cliffside and a battle off in the distance, you have to make that space just for looks. And that's nice, right? That works great for, say, God of War, where it's just part of their design and how they present their environment. But for a lot of open world games, it's not an option. Imagine that we're building a scene from Indiana Jones. Now, in the scene, and he's being chased, and then he just encounters some people across the way of the bridge, and he has to deal with the space. We also know that we have the ravine, where we have these American alligators, which, bless their hearts, are trying to pass off as Indian crocodiles. <laughs> they're down there in the ravine, 
But in the movie, that space purely exists so that we can see some bad guys get knocked down and demonstrate the danger that Indy's in. If we're building that space for an open world game, well, somebody has to spend the time building that space. And I might come to you and say, well, what happens if the player jumps off this bridge? Right? Remember, the player's not a jackass. We already established that. We've built a world that says you can go there, and so we have to deal with it. All right, so, you know, all right, so kill box is not an option, is it? No, no kill boxes. All right. Well, the player drowns. Well, okay. If the rule of your game is the players can't swim, then putting them over a pit of water is a kill box. No, you can't do that. All right. Those crocodiles are beasts. They'll rip you up, right? You get down there, and they're just going to wreck you. Well, are they a kill box? No, you could beat them. Oh, okay. Have you heard of this game? Yes. <laughs> That's not going to detract from the experience with some people. A lot of people are going to get down there, find those uh, crocodiles, and that's their game now. They don't care what happens to the other side of the bridge. They just found this thing, right? They want the alligator pearl, that thing's going to spit up when you kill it. You know what happens if there is no alligator pearl? You've just given the player a huge middle finger, right? We build the space, we make it accessible. That's a reality. We have to deal with it in some way. So we try and provide motivations for it. You know, an anecdote from Skyrim, we have uh, these dragon lairs throughout the world, and they're just in the world. Now, dragons are not in the game from the start. They're turned on after you hit a certain story mission, but you can hit that story mission fast. We have no semblance of control at Bethesda over what level you're going to be or how capable you're going to be of dealing with a dragon at any point in the game when you find one of these POIs. So we have one called Shearpoint. Now, Shearpoint is just to the east of Whiterun, I believe. It's on a low mound. It's not really up in some hairy peak. And the designer who was working on this came to me one afternoon and was like, well, I was talking to Jeff, and he says that we need to place another one of these dragon priests in the world. And you're the dragon priest guy, so tell me what to do. I'm like, all right, well, let's go over your locations. What do you have? And he has Shearpoint. All right, well, let's put him there. Whoa, whoa, wait. You're going to present the player with dragons, which are ostensibly the hardest creature in the game. And then you're going to present a player with a dragon priest. Now, if you don't know Skyrim, dragon priests, there's only like nine of them in the world, and they're pretty gnarly guys, right? So you have one of the other more difficult fights in the game, and you're going to put them on top of each other in the open world next to the starting town. Yes, I am. That's what we're going to do. Because you can always run from this, right? Dragons are actually designed to break off combat if you get too far from their roost. Dragon priest... They don't deal with cliffs and stuff. They're pretty easy to avoid in the exterior world. It's probably actually one of the easier Dragon Priest uh, fights. And we've provided sufficient motivation. Because if you win this fight, you're going to get a Dragon Soul, which is an important uh, element if you're a, a Dragonborn type of player. You're going to get a boss chest. And this is a visual language thing. These consistently are used to show that there's good loot. We put these one of these in the end of every dungeon. So you learn that this shape means good loot. Word of power. Again, if you're playing the Dragonborn type character and you're unlocking souls and using shouts, huge, huge piece of loot. You can only get word of power one place. This is where one of those words is. And then the Dragon Priest Mask. This is one of the unique Dragon Priests in the world, which means that he has a unique mask, which you can't get anywhere else. They've become very desirable loot, which is nice, because those were never on a design document. We just put them in. The nice thing about this challenge, too, is that I can run from the dragon skip the word of power because you have to kind of gain that and get out of combat and skip the dragon priest, but I can still run up, activate that boss chest, loot the stuff, and just hightail it. And you win. You win from running away. <laughs> <laughs> Some designers are uncomfortable with the notion of this idea of sort of rewarding failure, but that player didn't fail. You're a genius, right? I was level three and I ran up and I got this amazing staff and this helmet. I'm going to run back to Whiterun and sell them. You win, sir. Good for you. <laughs> right? There's no problem with that. And if you win at this fight and you take things down, you know what? This is one of the more retold stories on like message boards and such of people figuring out how to beat the sheer point dragon fight at a low level. We created a great experience for players. This isn't part of the quest. It isn't a story arc or narrative that culminates here. This is just in the world. We didn't do anything, really. We just took these elements, we combined them. You know, that all exist separately. We could put any of these things by themselves somewhere, and they hopefully provide a good experience. We just put them together in a novel way that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world, and hopefully they enjoy it. Some people did. So some of this ties into what we call consolation. Now, at the Bethesda, 
um, we often have to deal with things like that, with that crocodile thing, right? So you put something down there because people have like an emotional needle that's running all the time. When the player jumps into that crocodile pit and they get nothing, it's gonna tend to ping the needle in the wrong direction, right? And it's turned it into a negative experience. Now this gets back to the idea of rewarding failure. Ah, eh, the person failed, they weren't supposed to fall, the, the bridge collapsed and they didn't do the quick time event fast enough. Nah, you're a jerk. Give them something for it, right? Because again, in the types of games that we make, players may choose to jump down there and we've validated that type of behavior elsewhere throughout the game, so why not here? This isn't unique to Bethesda. If you've ever played a Final Fantasy, you probably finished the game with 99 high potions and Phoenix downs. They're much less open than our games in general, but they have a lot of branching paths and little nooks and crannies. And a good percentage of the time, those nooks and crannies have little treasure chests. Sometimes you're going to find your Omega Shotgun Class 5 Endgame Phoenix there. Sometimes you find a high potion. Now, the point here is that the loot doesn't have to be great or unique. It's nice if it is, and you do want to try and scale the loot to the experience that the player had to go through to get it, but even if you've got nothing, right? The game's about to go gold, and, and I've told you you need to put in some loot there. You can just put in a chintzy potion chest, and it's still going to take that emotional needle and hopefully prevent it from pinging down, and maybe even prevent it, or maybe even ping it in a positive direction and make an emotional spike for the player finding that thing. It also gives your game a handcrafted feel. When players explore nook and crannies in games, they've been trained by other games not to expect anything, right? When players try and break the game, they've been trained to expect the game not to support certain behaviors. When you can turn that around on them, you're winning as a designer. One example of this from Skyrim ties back into the Dragon Priest masks. Again, the Dragon Priest mask, that whole thing, never designed. That was me and one of our artists who just had an idea that we wanted to do. We just dropped it in the game. This screenshot is from an area called Labyrinthian. Now, Labyrinthian is this big exterior thing, and against our usual um, inclinations, we had to lock a large part of Labyrinthian off. So a player who goes to Labyrinthian early in the game has to fight frost trolls, which are a pain, can't get into the main body of the dungeon, which we hate doing. So there's a little temple at the center. And this is at the center of that temple, and there's a note which has some backstory and some clues, and this little wooden mask. And that wooden mask is a catalyst for the entire Dragon Priest activity. Again, it's not it's never will appear in your quest log, it's never been designed, it's not a story thing per se. It's just this little thing that players get to do, which is super unique. It's consolation. We put it there specifically because we wanted players who went there and found a way to survive, something to reward them that scaled to the amount of effort if they went up there at say level two. It's just part of our whole ideology. So a lot of this has been talking about player motivation either within a space, say with landmarks, or maybe at sort of more of a systems design level. I want to talk a little about actually motivating at the world level. This is a specific example from Skyrim. Or not Skyrim, really, but all of our games at Bethesda. And it's a notion of POI density. Now I've referenced POIs before. It's just point of interest. POI density is sort of a metric that we use at Bethesda to get an idea for how thickly packed in the variety of uh, POIs that exist in the world. So how POI density can be sort of defined and arrived at is by first determining what kind of options you have for POIs in your world. Say that you're building Skyrim, POIs can include things like civil war castles and forts, caravans, uh, hunters wandering around the environment, animal bases, dungeon entrances, uh, merchants, towns, all these sorts of things that you see sprinkled around the world. Figure out what those are for your experience. Then figure out the time that it takes, not for the player, but for you as a developer, to build the POI. In Skyrim, a city takes a designer, most of the project, and an artist, his entire work on the project will be building that one city. It's a huge time sink. It takes time. You can't build too many of those. But a POI, like say the Dragon Priest mask thing or SharePoint, a good designer can bang out two to six of those in a day if they've got the assets they need. No big deal. Other things scale in between. We have metrics for that, saying we have dungeons that are about this scope that take this much time because they have a bunch of story or a bunch of layout. We have dungeons that have less of that and are more radiant or systemic. And those take a different amount of time to, to lay in. Once you figure that out, you can talk about your desired POI density. 
Now, desired PR identity just gets down to physically in the space how much of that stuff is around the player. For instance, at Bethesda, we tend to try and scatter the POIs in such a density that if the player is in any given point of the environment and spins and turns in a full 360 circle, that there's at least one, two, or three things visible within reach that the player can get to without too much uh, difficulty. So the Washington Monument doesn't count. Dragon's Reach doesn't count unless you're in the vicinity. We want things that you can get to soon, right? From there, you can extrapolate your vertical chunk estimate. So a vertical chunk, you guys probably uh, know what a vertical slice is. It's when you build a demo of a game that it goes deep on features. So maybe you can play like one area and it's got your inventory, it's got some dialogue, it's got quest objectives, and some environment art is finished. But the rest of the game is a shambles, right? That's what a vertical slice is. You can build a vertical chunk as well. So a vertical chunk would be a square footage of an area that you build in just the same way. But the goal here is to determine the POI density. So if we take a chunk of the world and we say, okay, well, there's a city, and then there's a town, there's four dungeons here, 15 little uh, exterior POIs, and a couple of dynamic roaming creatures, okay, well, how long does that take for someone to set up? If we're talking about, a, say, a 10 by 10 or a 7 by 7 cell area, cells being a unit of measurement in uh, Bethesda games. Once you figure that out and you actually build a vertical chunk, you can extrapolate that against the time you have in your schedule. This gets into one of the things that I think has doomed a lot of open world projects, either to cancellation or to overly long development cycles. We don't really think about this, right? We determine what a cool area would be, right? It would be cool to do New York City, or the whole island of Manhattan, right? And you don't necessarily think about these sorts of things ahead of time. You just determine the physical scale of the world that you want. What happens is that you'll build the game out and then you realize that your density stinks and you try and rush it in to match the time of the schedule or you try and pair back to match the time of the schedule. There's a lot of angst about scheduling and production in the, in the game development industry, but it's a reality. I mean, if you want your experiences to get to eyeballs, think about schedule and work with producers to get it there and then you can make smart decisions to scale your design according to schedule without having to make painful sacrifices later on. Speaking of painful sacrifices, I'll give you guys a couple of examples from uh, Fallout 3. So we did exactly what I just told you not to do for Fallout 3. We decided that we wanted this chunk of uh, Maryland and Virginia and DC. So we have the city down to this certain point. We go out to sort of uh, we, we heavily fictionalized the scale of the world, so like that's supposed to be like South Pennsylvania up there. Uh, that's more like where my house is. So we figured out what the world was. We figured out what kind of story locations we wanted. We scanned them out. And this is one of the very first maps uh, from Fallout 3 production in probably 2005. What happened is closer to uh, mid to early 2008, when the game shipped in October 2008, we played the game for the first time. And what I mean by that, and anybody who's made a game professionally probably can relate to this, is when you're working on a game that's a moving target, a game in development, there are a lot of things that don't come together until late that you don't really understand about your own game. And then you get to play the game, and you go, ah, that's what's good. Oh, that's what sucks. One thing we've realized with Fallout 3 was that the POI density, which we used to determine our early like schedule and how many spaces we should build, was wrong. We used the same POI density that we'd used in Oblivion. And so Fallout 3 had a little bit too theme parky of a feel, right? I mean, it's supposed to feel lonely and desolate at times, but everywhere you were in the wasteland, there was just too much stuff around you. This is a criticism some people will level at the final game, but believe me, it was way more, even if you felt that way about the final game. It was, you stand in a bandit camp and there's a town there and a settlement there and everything was just too close together. Crap, what do we do? The game feels wrong and we have to ship this year. So anybody who's worked on a game as a producer can just come in shrieking when I say we did this. <laughs> we said, oh, we'll just add 10 cells to two borders. No big deal. Any math majors in here can probably figure out that's not, not a big deal. We punched the map out, and this took the team offline completely for six to eight weeks. And we're talking all level design, all art, period. Even environment, or I'm sorry, even character art helped out with this. We have to build the space, we have to nav mesh it, it also means we have to generate more LOD out, 
in the world, so we have to actually do world building that you'll never reach just to generate LOD. And then we had to pick and choose things to take out of here and scatter throughout the new area to get the density right. And then we realized that we'd added too much new space and we had it to, uh, the faster thing than to scale it back down was to even add more dungeons and POIs out into the expanded area to get the density correct there. You can feel some of this in, in the final game because that area of the map just slightly tweaks the knob in a way that is sort of subtle, but you feel the POI density shift out there because we did it in the last year of production. But it's one of those things where sometimes the game just needs X, and you've got to give it that. It hurt a lot, but I don't know what the game would have been like without it. Counterexample, the DC neighborhoods. So in Fallout 3, the DC neighborhoods are separate uh, loaded world spaces because we couldn't have achieved the visual density we wanted for those as part of the streaming world. So when you go down to DC, say you load into Pennsylvania Avenue, or you load into the mall, or you load into Tacoma Park, what you end up doing is you wander into the wasteland, you hit the curtain wall, DC, you go like down into a subway, and you come up, you get to the end of that neighborhood. You go down to subway, you come up, you get into a neighborhood. Now, there are, again, there are a number of reasons in the final game you can feel this not working out really well for us. Um, what you may not realize is the scope of the problem was double. In the final game, there are 12 or 13, I think, neighborhoods in the game. The original uh, concept of the game had 26. And each of those had its own connection points so that you would go through different train stations, the different tunnels, or different buildings and arrive in different locations in the world. And for all the same reasons that you might criticize the final game, we realized that you couldn't get where you wanted to go, things were far too confusing, the metros were this labyrinthian house that you had to go through. What are we going to do? We caught half of them. This photo here is from me and uh, one of the low designers I work with, Darl Brigner, just trying to deal with the scope of reorganizing those spaces. Again, because it was such a mess of connectivity, all we could do is make this sort of uh, serial killer-esque map of the city <laughs> and connect the pieces with thread. Those are actual printouts of all the different levels. And we actually identified where the load doors were, and we put a thumbtack there and run a string. Um, it made the game far better. But again, if we had thought more about the experience earlier on, and got to play it well early on, with both this and the adding the wasteland, we could save ourselves a lot of headache. So it really, really, really benefits you to look at the mistakes you've made, look at the mistakes that others have made, and then build that kind of cognizance into your processes when you're going into a project early on. And constantly reevaluate your schedule, constantly reevaluate your goals, and remember your end <coughs> Your end uh, goal in the whole thing is to provide players with motivation, provide players with the kinds of experiences you want them to have, and to do it without them feeling you pushing on the back of their shoulders every step of the way. Uh, that's it. Got some information. If you want to get a hold of me, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, the Level Design in the Day group on Facebook, that's the group of guys that I go to GDC with every year lately. Um, so feel free to join that. It's an open group. People post uh, job openings to that sometimes. Also, people will post interesting talks, so I'm not a big Facebook guy, but I do recommend that. Uh, but yeah, thanks very much. I think we've got a little bit of time, so if anybody has any questions at all, I'm happy to take them. Um, so you're saying that um, in Skyrim, you use a lot of like audio cues uh, to draw people towards DLIs. Um, I thought like, the biggest thing in Skyrim that drew me to different things were dragons. Because you can't just ignore a dragon. Right. Uh, like things that would change and all that. And, like I feel like I discovered different areas because of dragons. Like I was going from point A to point B, like I gotta see what the team's going. But then the dragon comes, like that kind of that obviously derails me from going point A to point B. Right. So like was there some kind of threshold you guys are trying to figure out, like in case if um, the dragon was wordless, it was like deliberate distraction it was too strong? and derail plus. The notion of derailing just doesn't exist. But that's okay. it. uh, it's part of our design. We want to derail. That's what keeps you sort of, you know, it's the one more turn phenomenon from Civ, is if there's always a new carrot dropping out in front of you, then there's always something new and interesting to do. And so, again, if you're so engaged in what you're trying to do that you will ignore a dragon and run by it, then the game supports that. 
the dragons themselves were actually specifically authored to roam around their roosts. And we had actually built a whole LOD system for actors, which was something we hadn't had before, so that you could actually see dragons. They used to just pop out. Like, oh, shoot, we need a new feature. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they roar periodically. That's actually a, a variable that we control, you know, how frequently they roar to try and get the muted distance of them. Um, we actually have in the radiant story system, which is sort of our, like, our uh, systemic thing that sits on the top and, and looks at what you're doing. It's similar in concept to the Left 4 Dead Storyteller. It looks for what you're doing and sends stuff to you. Dragons are actually one of the things it will send to you where if you're roaming from a sort of point to point, we'll send dragons sort of flying by that don't engage you, that just sort of fly overhead like in twos or threes and go someplace. Just with the idea that like maybe you'll just like, oh, there's a dragon. Go check it out. Maybe you fight it, maybe you just follow it. Uh, but yeah, we, we really don't worry about derailing. We more care about that stuff once you're in an interior. So generally, if we really, really care about giving you a explicitly authored linear experience, we do that indoors. Now, outdoors, the experience is all about free roam and open. But that's one reason why if you play uh, Skyrim Dungeons, they are very, very dis deliberately linear. And that's a choice that we made, was we said, OK, exteriors for free roam, interiors for linear. And we took a turn from the Fallout 3 level design you know, Bible, so to speak, and made these spaces that have like those loop bags and drop downs and everything. So then, if a, say, quest designer came to us and was like, well, I want to do something, and it really doesn't support distraction, we would say, okay, well, how do we make this part of an interior experience for them? Which is another reason why you have these uh, sort of tonally big and open dungeons in Skyrim. That you, it's not something you would necessarily see in Fallout 3 or Oblivion, where you go into a dungeon and it expands into this giant cavern that feels like outside. Um, just trying to play with that experience that you have, more or less. I don't think that's your question. Uh, so when you're starting off designing a level, I guess specifically this model, since that's generally what we do, we don't have to do any giant open world stuff. Where do you begin when you say, I need, I need to design this level, how do you get started? Generally, we pick one or two sort of anchors for the level that we care about. Now, an anchor could be a layout detail that you care about, so you want to create a super vertical space, you know, or there's an interesting combination of pieces you found. It might be a script, like puzzle or something that you want to do. It may be purely narrative, or maybe a gameplay goals that you have. You choose those anchors and then let that influence a lot of the other decisions. <coughs> One thing that we don't do at Bethesda is we never paper map. Uh, we just get the pieces, we go in the editor, and we build with those. We, that influences our entire schedule where, you know, if we're going into a new project, the absolute first thing we need to do is work with artists on building our kits. Because if you've used the GAC or the creation kit, there are no in editor primitives. It's not a BSP or CSG editor where you can just rough out shapes like you can in, you know, uh, in Hammer or in, in uh, Unreal or anything like that. So our common anchors, like we start with, at the very beginning we have a list that says, these are the locations that we have in the game. These are the basic uh, architectural sets that they will use, the primary architectural set. And this is the enemy type that it will have. And that's it. Like, it's just a name. So for instance, with uh, Fallout 3, say, uh, you know, one of my colleagues, Jeff Brown. Like, all right, Jeff, you have the Dunwich building, and it's an office, and there are ghouls, and it's called Dunwich, by the way, because like I really like H.P. Lovecraft, and I'm cool if you reference that. And Jeff runs with that and makes one of the most badass horror-themed dungeons in the game, right? So yeah, we just pick something that we care about and let everything else be influenced by that. So on, on that note of the dungeons, uh, you know, obviously the Bethesda games, um, and, and you know, in my experience, particularly with Skyrim, each dungeon seems so meticulously and carefully crafted in terms of story um, as well. When you guys are just designing the individual dungeons and, and, and you're having a team design them as well, the notion of narrative and story, do you guys tend to you know, write all that stuff and all the books that you might find within? Is there a team of folks that, that also do some of the writing? Do you guys work together? Uh, how does that process work? Our design team at Bethesda is uh, structured into two groups, and that's quest and level design. So there are, I think on Skyrim, if you skim the credits, there's eight in each group for that game. Now, um, the way I typically characterize it is that level designers are thinking about the player at a moment-to-moment -moment level this corner and a trap fires off, or they script this guy to jump out right at this moment. The quest designers are thinking more about your hour-to-hour -hour experience. So like, yeah, Al really cares how you feel about Mercer Frey, right? Think about Mercer Frey and your motivations towards him throughout this multi-quest span. Um, so those guys in practice tend to do more writing 
Um, but they also are responsible for things like, for instance, those guys tend to get town tasks, setting up the town merchants and things like that, whereas the level designers are more building physical space. So with level design, when you play a particular level and say you're having that reaction where this feels really crafted, if it's a level that's just part of a quest line and it's not like a radiant dungeon that's chosen randomly to fill in a part of a quest, generally speaking, that's going to be heavily collaborative between the level and the quest designer. So the quest designer tends to have goals for how things will pay, play out at certain points, like you hit this room and some characters show up and they have some lines or a thing happens and it's all very carefully staged. That's going to be part of the level designer, maybe doing some of the scripting, or the level quest designer might do some of the scripting. These guys have very overlapping skill sets, so each time it's different. If you're playing a dungeon which has no quest hooks, that's all the level designer. Now, in general, when we're hiring our level designers, we don't hire great writers. I mean, it's not, it's nice to get, but we don't look for that. So a lot of times what will happen is our level designers will put in barks, like I'll write a scene and I care about you know, a guy saying, hey, I want you to do this, and do this now, and good job. And then, like, a real big boy writer will come by and, like, dress those lines up. Um, level designers love books because they're, you know, quick and easy, no dialogue count. Uh, it's probably a bad habit. We use it too much. But uh, it's it's pretty collaborative. I mean, some of the level designers write better than others. We actually had, I won't, t I won't tell you where, because I don't want you to know, but in one of our games or DLCs, a uh, level designer actually went in and sketched a bunch of barks from a character, and the quest designer was supposed to revise them, like just quit, and never did it. And so, and so there's some really bad dialogue in a particular level where it's just this guy is like, go left now! <laughs> <laughs> the voice actor in the booth just must have been like, I'm supposed to read this in an accent or something? <laughs> Think over there? Yeah, so you spoke a bit about player defined goals. Yes. So just something that could be very difficult to predict and get convoluted. What are some of the techniques that you can utilize early on to gather or learn about some of those? I mean, the, the thing with player critical is that they can be so random. I mean, imagine, because I'm sure this guy exists, right? That like you've played every MMO you could ever get your hands on, and you always role play like the blue knight. And so it doesn't matter what the stats are in an armor set. If it's blue, it goes in like your stash, and you're going to dress up that way, right? You, you can't. You can't know every type of role players you're going to have. So it comes down to trying to define the goals that your game is deliberately trying to support. So for instance, say you're building a Deus Ex game, and you want to deliberately support stealth hacking in combat, right? Like, okay, like, Human Revolution is a master class. The Detroit Police Station, awesome, because it supports those things very, very well. Where you can go through that space, multiple exterior entrances, it's total Swiss cheese, level design, like, it's great. Um, as far as the other stuff, if you can find ways through building and testing and watching people play your level to support things people try to do, especially things that people don't expect to work, that's like ultimate gravy. Because that's the stuff that you can't predict, and players, when they do that stuff, kind of expect the game not to handle. So when you pay that stuff off, it's awesome. But that really just comes out of being super insightful, playing through your stuff, playing through fresh eyes, thinking about types of players that might play through it and then putting their eyeballs on and replaying the content and then just getting the level in front of people and watching them play it and shutting your mouth and letting them do their thing. Another question was over here. Um, yes and no. So one thing we would never do is damage the base game for the sake of modding. Um, but and modding is near and dear to my heart. I've, ever since I got to Bethesda, I've been a big part of our push to get the mod tools set up. And you know, like the, the wikis and video tutorials, level designers, we all just do those. We write those, and make those happen. Otherwise, there would be nothing. Um, and it really, like the, and I, this is a bit of a tangent, but it's something I care about a lot. Um, thinking about modders especially when you're doing like systems and uh, tools design specifically and workflow, forces us to be honest. Because it's easy when you're like making a tool or a workflow to say like, oh, well that thing's a pain, but you can work around it, you're smart, and you're only doing it X number of times. 
But if you think about like, okay, what about the modder who like, you know, is living in Czechoslovakia and doesn't know how to read the wiki and, and can he intuit how to work this thing out? And it really makes us design our tools better, uh, which of course helps us long term as well as helping us have a good modding community. Uh, but we would never like deliberately leave an expanse of land open that should be filled because we want it to be like modder friendly. That said, there are things that, uh, for instance, if you go through the un uncompiled script source code in uh, Papyrus, there are actually a number of my scripts where like I tried to do something and it didn't have time or it wasn't working out or I knew it wouldn't be as polished as I wanted it to be or I actually deliberately put in like a comment that says, note to modders, if you want to do X, Y, and Z, this is a good place to do it, here's what I tried. Uh, so that we do try and do it and think about them at every step as much as possible. Other questions? All right, guys. Well, oh, wait. No. Last question. Go for it. Um, since the post moral went, uh, a lot of the major locales in the Bethesda games have been isolated or in separate zones. Is that due to technical limitations or because the designers kind of want those zones to be isolated? That depends. Uh, if you're talking about like DLC type stuff, then it's pretty much a technical thing. Um, that, like, you know, it sounds like you in the back probably have done some modding for our stuff, and it can be a pain trying to mod on top of base games, especially if you're adding new land. Um, so, it, because once somebody touches it, nobody else can touch it. So for our own purposes, it makes a lot of sense to go off to separate land masses. It also gives you your own sort of creative space to define it. There are a number of creative reasons to do it too. Um, within the base games themselves, it's usually because we want to define a different locale for uh, like tonal reasons. For instance, this may not be the best example, but say Blackreach in Skyrim is something that we put in as a separate thing and not part of like one specific dungeon because we wanted an emotional reaction when you get to the end of like this laboriously long dwarven dungeon that kind of starts to look the same after like 45 minutes and then you come out and this thing is totally different than you've never seen. Uh, but then you take things like, uh, I can't think of the name off the, hand, off the top of my head, but there's like an island that you go out to uh, in Skyrim and there's a, like a siege on it. Like we set those things really far apart from the world because technically we know that we can just go more crazy and throw a lot of stuff at it. Um, but then like even the, I think it's called the bloated float, the, the inn on a boat in Oblivion that you like sleep on and when you wake up pirates have hijacked and you're out in the open seas. Like that's purely just to screw with the player's head, like just to put you in a new place and you know isolate you from everything else. So it's, it's a tool that we'll use deliberately but sparingly for both technical and creative reasons. It just depends on the case example. All right, thanks a lot, guys. You've been great. Let's thank you.